First of all, I guess I should tackle the indelicate first. Let's be indelicate. That awful book you wrote, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, not that the book itself, uh, from my point of view, was awful, but the book was awful from the point of view of my mother. L listen, my mother considered that she had a womb for one reason only, and that was to produce a biographer. So she read the entire works of Shakespeare to my sister in the womb so that she would produce this sort of literati child. And it turned out to just put Vanessa off reading and writing for life. So my mother focused her not inconsiderable attention on me. I couldn't be anything but a writer. She is a ferocious woman. What she's, when she says, jump, you jump. So I left the Africa, went to the States, but was too nervous to really tackle head on my childhood and to be honest with you I didn't think it was that interesting so many people that I grew up with had lives very similar to mine so I wrote 10 wildly unsuccessful novels finally after my agent had fired me I thought well I might as well just write the truth I didn't think the awful book was going to get published so I wrote don't let's go to the dogs tonight I considered it my memoir my mother considered it her unauthorized biography and objected not to the point that I had brought out how much we drank, or even really the level of racism, this kind of deep, open wound of a secret that existed in Southern Africa when I was growing up, which was that the whites were unbelievably racist, that that was a racist war. It wasn't a war as now has been sort of the revisionist history, oh, well, we were fighting communism. It was a racial war. What my mother objected to in that book most strongly was that she had presented to the world a face of such courage and such stiff upper lip sort of getting on with itness and what I exposed was the deep grieving that went on behind closed doors when she lost her three children um, and the manner of her grieving which was so physical that she so physical and so deep and so psychic that she finally you know did lose her mind and I think she felt that I that she had lost face because I'd exposed that um, and it was a terrible sort of burden and feeling, really, that I had. But as the South African writer Bessie Head once said when challenged about her writing, I write because I have the authority from life to do so. And it was my life. I have a feeling that it's probably made her more popular and more respected than less. Am I... Because I... Uh, in general. Yeah. In general, I would say that's absolutely correct. Because anyone reading that book, I think... It gets torn between, you know, her, her horrendous politics. I mean, she always says that she's right of Attila the Hun. I always say she's a liberal trapped in the body of Attila the Hun. But she's incredibly well-read. She's phenomenally compassionate. She has this almost uncanny ability to see grief and desperation in another person and to respond to it in this very hands-on way. And yet she's also a woman who, you know, picked up a gun and fought to keep Rhodesia white run. Oddly enough, I think because the book is so honest about her, people are able to see through, um, you know, I, th I think the stereotypes of what it is to be a racist to the human being underneath that. Um, and so, no, she has a huge fan club. Uh, so in some ways this is kind of a secret sequel to that? Sequel, prequel, because one of the things that mum said, and this was fair enough, was I didn't start existing when you were born and I didn't stop existing when you left home, but I think that's very often our experience of our parents, that we only see the snapshot of them, that we um, experience our parents as they were as parents to us, not as they were as human beings. So this book sought to redress that because she said, you know, I was someone. Um, and in the interviews, the extensive interviews that I did with her, the sort of most overpowering message was that here I was, the most glamorous woman in East Africa, and I'd met this beautiful man, my father, sort of eccentric Englishman. And we married, and we were wildly in love, and we were violently in love with the land. And listening to the interviews, to almost a decade after I'd done them, I taped these interviews, um, and when I finally had the courage to sort of pull them off the shelf and listen to them, there was a point at which my mother's talking about the death of my elder brother. And she talks about walking out of the hospital in what was then Salisbury, now Harare, after he had died of meningitis. And it was October, so the jacarandas were in bloom, and the 
clouds were sort of building up on the horizon for a storm and the flower sellers were selling flowers in Meikle Square. And mum said, you know, the, the awful thing is the world was carrying on, but how could it? Because in, inside me, my world had ended. And listening to those interviews, I realized I was al almost old enough to be the mother of the woman that had lost that child. And I wanted to do the impossible, which was reach back in her life and stop what was to come next, which was the loss of two more children, a war, the loss of five farms and the loss of her mind. I couldn't fix that, but I, what I could do with this book is show the incredible courage and resilience of the woman who brought herself back from those tragedies and losses with indescribable humor, vigor, and vibrancy. The first one was that awful book. Don't let's go to the dogs tonight. Yes, dare we say the title. How does she feel about this one? Well, she, you know, she said to me, well, I suppose now I have my fans. So I'll just set myself up in a glass cage at the bottom of the farm's driveway with velvet curtains and people can put a hundred thousand quatre in the slot and the velvet curtains will slowly draw open and people can watch me have my cocktails under the tree of forgetfulness. Have you, you've got three kids? I have three children. Uh, uh, oldest is? Eighteen, my, and then I have a fifteen-year-old son and a six-year-old daughter. Have you shipped them out to grandma? I have. I actually this summer sent my 18-year-old out to grandma and <laughs> she, she came back to Wyoming and she said, my God, mum, you underwrote that woman. <laughs> that, that may be the best accolade you'll ever get. From exactly. The book. Well done. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. The book is Cocktail Hour Under the Tree of Forgetfulness. I've been speaking with the author, Alexandra Fuller, and Cocktail Hour Under the Tree of Forgetfulness, published by Random House of Canada.